We ready? Okay, great. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, my name is uh, Alan Cooperman. I'm a, an associate professor here at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin. I'd like to start the event today by thanking uh, some folks. First of all, I'd like to thank the European Union, uh, which provided uh, a lot of the funding for this event. I would also like to um, thank our sponsoring organizations here at the University of Texas, the EU Center for Excellence, the Center for European Studies, uh, and the LBJ School of Public Affairs, which has provided this excellent facility uh, and staffing. Uh, personally, I would like to thank uh, Doug Biao, who is the director of the Center for European Studies and put together the grant that allowed for this event to happen. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, four folks working here at the University of Texas. Uh, uh, Tomas, Go uh, Tomas Gomez, who just uh, uh, walked in. That's uh, my assistant, also Sally K. Dixon and Charlotte Harris uh, over at the Center for European Studies, uh, and Ellie Pupko, who is a graduate student here and will be our rapporteur for today's events. I'd also like to thank my fellow presenters. We have uh, 13 who came from outside Austin, Texas, um, some from as far away as the United Kingdom and Switzerland, and we have uh, three of uh, my colleagues here from the University of Texas at Austin. The group that's going to be presenting today is, uh, uh, someone said to me today, how did you get all these folks? These are the best folks. And, and they really are the best folks. This is my wish list of experts. Uh, and it's a mix of scholars and practitioners. We may not solve all of the questions about secession today, but if so, uh, it won't be for lack of having the smartest and most knowledgeable people in the world here trying to do so. So as an introduction to today's events, what I want to do is talk about why I organized this symposium on secession. And when I was thinking about it, there were really, I would say, four big events over the last quarter century that I found uh, very troubling because they risked destabilizing international politics and increasing the incidence of bloody civil war. I'll be brief in, in going over these four because our presenters all day today are experts and they will be going into detail. The first one was the breakup of the former Yugoslavia in 1991, 1992. The international community's initial position was to oppose recognizing secession. But then, after things got violent, after we uh, got war, subsequently the international community did recognize the independence of Slovenia, Croatia, and Bosnia. By doing so, and regardless of any good that was accomplished by those recognitions, the international community effectively rewarded violence. In other words, no recognition when it was nonviolent, and then it was violent, and then there was recognition. That is effectively rewarding violence, and that perversely created an incentive for future violence, which is, in my opinion, exactly the opposite of what the international community should be doing, which is creating incentives for peace. In that case, on the positive side, and in former Yugoslavia, at least these recognitions quickly became universal, which minim minimized any problems of disputed sovereignty. The second uh, seminal event uh, for me was in 2008 uh, with Kosovo's unilateral declaration of independence, which was quickly recognized by the United States and most, but not all, of the European Union. Again, this rewarded violence. When it was nonviolent, there was no recognition. Then it was violent. Then there was recognition. And uh, you can't get away from the fact that that rewards violence. But in this case, there was an additional problem. And that is that there was disputed sovereignty. Uh, about half the countries in the world still do not recognize the independence of Kosovo five years after its declaration. The countries that don't recognize Kosovo include Serbia, which claims sovereignty over Kosovo still, and several EU states. This disputed sovereignty hinders stability, trade, investment, economic development, and the potential for EU accession, which I think everyone thinks is uh, an important goal. Other countries that don't recognize Kosovo include Russia, China, and India. So the two biggest countries in the world don't recognize Kosovo, and two out of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council don't recognize Kosovo. Um, 
And so we have a schism in the leadership of the international community. The third seminal event was Georgia, several months uh, after the Kosovo uh, recognition. There was a brief war between Russia and Georgia, and Russia then recognized two secessionist entities within Georgia. Uh, Russia explicitly cited the Kosovo precedent. Uh, and even if it did so insincerely and instrumentally, this reinforced the precedent. We had two cases of this in one year. Uh, and uh, my fear was this could be the start of a new emerging norm that could lead to contagious secession and civil war. Again, in the Georgia case, we have disputed sovereignty. And even though far fewer countries have joined Russia uh, in recognizing the secessionist entities in Georgia than recognized Kosovo's independence, uh, still that disputed sovereignty has very similar effect. It hinders stability, hinders trade, investment, economic development, and not EU accession, but NATO accession. The fourth uh, phenomenon that struck me was the resurgence of secession in the European uh, zone. And so within the EU, we have, for example, and we'll be talking about many of these cases today, we have in Spain the secessionist movement in Catalonia. In the UK, the secessionist movement in Scotland. In Belgium, the secessionist movement in Flanders. Of course, we have the long-running dispute in Cyprus as well, and there are other cases that will be mentioned. There are also um, secessionist movements in EU candidate countries. So in Moldova, we have the Transnistria region. In Bosnia, we have Republika Srpska. In Kosovo, we have North Kosovo. So those are the four um, events over the last quarter century that motivated me to organize today's symposium, which I hope will address at least two pressing questions for the international community. First, vis-a-vis -vis Kosovo and Georgia, what can we do to resolve the disputed sovereignty? which leaves those two places fragile, vulnerable to renewed violence, and very troubling precedents. And the second of the two questions is, is more prospective. Uh, rather than figuring out how to fix what's gone before, looking forward, can we forge a coherent policy towards secession? At least between the European Union and the United States, and ideally among the entire international community. A policy that can promote stability, discourage violence, but at the same time uphold democratic rights of self-determination. So uh, that's the substance today, and just a few words about the procedures. We're going to have four panels today. There will be breaks in between, uh, and then lunch in between the second and third panel. The first panel is on Kosovo, the second panel is on Georgia, the third panel is on the current European challenges, and the fourth panel is on forging a transatlantic policy towards these secessionist movements. Each panelist will get 15 minutes to present. Uh, I am a uh, tough, tough uh, moderator. I wield the gavel. I will hold up these signs that say five minutes and two minutes, and you never want to see the zero minutes, I assure you, uh, but you will if, if you go for longer than 15 minutes. And. Um, uh, we will have questions and answers after each panel, so please hold your questions until the four panelists have gone. We'll have three presenters and a discussant, and then we'll have Q&A. There's a microphone over here, and so uh, if you have questions, and at the end of the panel, please just queue up behind this microphone, and I will be moderating the Q&A. We are video recording the event for posting on the internet, and so if you don't want to be on the video, don't go up to the microphone uh, and speak. And then lastly, uh, at the end of today's events, at 5.30, we will have a reception here in this room. And uh, I would invite all of you to, to join us. It's a great time to, to meet all of the speakers and for them to meet you as well. So without any further ado, we will turn now to our first panel, which is about uh, Yugoslavia and Kosovo. And our first presenter is Gordon Bardos. Gordon is currently president of Syracon, which is a political risk and strategy advisory firm specializing uh, in southeastern Europe. He publishes frequently on political developments in the Balkans in journals such as the National Interest. 
and he is the former assistant director at Columbia University of the Harriman Institute for Russian, Eurasian, and Central European Studies. Gordon. Alan, thank you. Good morning. Um, it's kind of rough to be the first person up at <laughs> o'clock. If anybody wants to take a nap, feel free. I won't be offended. Um, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to come. I'm, I'm very honored to be here with everyone here. Um, and I do have to, I have to second something that Alan said. Um, when I look around the room and I see the names of everybody here, it is kind of like a wish list of some of the best people you could, you could want to be talking about these things. So I'm going to talk about the case of Kosovo um, and just throw out a, a few big ideas. We can go into the details later um, if you want to sort of suss out more substance. But I think at 9 o'clock in the morning, it's, it's best not to waddle in the, uh, in the detail too much. So the theses I have, part of what I would like to do is, is try to reconceptualize our understanding of secession. I think a lot of times when we talk about it, we think about it as a unique moment in history or a specific moment. Um, and I think especially in the case of Kosovo, um, what I hope to bring out is that this is just one stage in a long process, and the process not, is not over yet. Um, that leads to the second thesis is that secessionist problems have a long history. And if we look at cases like Cyprus and some other places around the world, we realize that these things go on for a long time. Um, finally, from the sort of political science perspective, I'd like to argue that um, rationalist and instrumentalist approaches to trying to deal with these problems do not work. At least that's not the evidence from, at least that's the evidence from the Kosovo case. And I would argue from other cases in the former Yugoslavia. Um, it'll be interesting when we get the Caucasus experts um, to see whether instrumentalist approaches to dealing with these problems have had any more success there. So, Now, the one caveat I want to make, um, I'm going to go through the, the history of, of this problem in Kosovo since basically the Congress of Berlin. Um, but this is really not a unique phenomenon to, to Kosovo or to the Albanians um, at all. I could make the exact same presentation about the movement for a greater Serbia over the past 200 years, I could make the exact same presentation about the movement for a greater Cro Croatia and so forth. So this is something that's, that's common to all Balkan nationalist movements. So that's just to give you a sense of sort of the areas that we're talking about. Albania proper, of course, is, is in the deep yellow. Um, what various Albanian groups claim is ethnic Albania or natural Albania encompasses parts of Montenegro, Kosovo, Serbia, almost up to Nish, um, large parts of, of Macedonia, and even parts of Greece. I'm going to breeze through this. It's a lot of empirical data. Um, I can give you more information later on if you want, but just to give you a sense of how long this has been going on. Um, the League of Prizren in 1878 started these claims. Um, the London Conference in December 1912, again this came up. Um, after the Kingdom of Yugoslavia was formed in 19, after World War I, um, Kosovo based, was in an almost constant state of rebellion in the 1920s. It was absolutely clear that the Albanian population simply was not happy being a part of, of, of this new state. From 1941 to 1945, most of Kosovo um, and Western Macedonia and even parts of Montenegro, I believe, uh, became part of uh, what uh, Greater Albania that was created. Now it's interesting, this little citation I have from um, the Communist Party of Yugoslavia had a conference in Kosovo in 1943, the so-called Buyan Conference. Um, and it's interesting that even from Marxist-Leninists and from communists, people that you would assume would not be very nationalist about these things, um, the conference adopted a very sort of nationalist, standard nationalist perspective on, on the issue. 
um, which obviously was at odds with Tito's policy after 1943 and 1945. Again, we see riots in Kosovo in 1968 demanding independence. Um, there you have what Danny Rustenow said about this. And again, if, if you really want a good analysis of the history of these things, um, Danny Rustenow wrote some really good reports on what was going on in Kosovo and in Yugoslavia in the late 1960s, 1970s. You know, part of the problem we have is that a lot of people assume that these problems started in 1987 or 1988. Um, if you go back and, you know, read Rusinau, read some other people, you'll realize this started a long, long time ago. Um, Kosovo riots in 1981, right after Tito died again, demands for republic status for Kosovo or uh, Kosovo joining Albania. There you have an interesting quote by Sali Bersha back in 1990. Um, and I don't know if, I think later on in the presentation I have something he said in Skopje just a few months ago, right along the same lines. So his position hasn't evolved very much. Now the failure, failure of rationalist and instrumentalist approaches to these problems. I, I think you can make a pretty strong argument um, that the former Yugoslavia probably went as far as almost any country I can think of in trying to adopt what political scientists would call rationalist and instrumentalist approaches to, to, dealing with, to dealing with these problems, not just in Kosovo, but, but throughout the former Yugoslavia, in terms of, you know, consociational decision making and, and um, appointing cadres from local nationalities and so forth. The, Yugosla the former Yugoslavia, Tito's Yugoslavia, had a pretty good, pretty good record on these issues. Uh, just to give you a couple examples in terms of, you know, the political approaches and the, and the appointment of cadres. As, as it pointed out, at one point in the 1980s, uh, Kosovo Albanian was the president of the Yugoslav state. And at a, another point in the 1980s, uh, Kosovo Albanian was the president of the Yugoslav Communist Party. Um, and Kosovo basically, I think I have a quote here. So the devolution of political authority that you saw in Kosovo, it was essentially an Albanian-run polity uh, within the former Yugoslavia. Now, in terms of economic approaches as well, I would argue that the former Yugoslavia, you know, did as much, about as much as, as any country I could think of to try to resolve these, these problems. Um, the former Yugoslavia had something called the Fund for the Redevelopment of the undeveloped regions or so forth. Basically, it was a revenue transfer system whereby Slovenia, Croatia, Vojvodina, and Serbia transferred funds to develop the lesser developed regions of Montenegro, uh, Bosnia, Kosovo, and Macedonia. And you can see what Kosovo's share of that was. It kept on growing from, from the 1970s on, from being one-third to getting up to almost 43% by by 1985, and in the period from 1981 to 1986, 95 percent of the investment funds in, in Kosovo uh, came from the other Yugoslav republics um, and provinces. So again, in terms, you know, of what you could even call a sort of a Marxist approach to, to dealing with these issues, the sort of belief that um, ethnicity is a sort of a facade or it's not tangible, um, that it's all about equalizing income and economic resources amongst, um, amongst different ethnic groups. The Yugoslav communists really tried to put that into effect. They really believed that, and it didn't work. Now, when we talk about secession, what are the unintended consequences um, when we open up a can of worms like this? Um, I would just ask a few, I would ask a few questions. Um, have we really improved the human rights situation in Kosovo um, over the past 12 years? You know, I think it's very, very questionable. I think what we saw from basically 1988 to 1999 was one ethnic group persecuting another ethnic group. What we've seen from 1999 to the present is one ethnic group persecuting another ethnic group. Um, basically, we've just sort of reversed, reversed uh, who's doing what. Um, but despite of everything that we've done in Kosovo over the past 
what is it now, 13, 14 years. Um, at one point, I believe that Kosovo was receiving more international aid per capita than Afghanistan was. Um, all the international resources that have gone into it. We haven't done a good job in creating um, the rule of law. We haven't done a good job of uh, protecting minority rights and so forth. So I would say that you know we haven't you know promoting secession or accepting secession really hasn't done much to improve the human rights situation there. Has there been spillover effects from the Caucasus? Uh, I think the panelists in the next panel will have a better sense of that. Um, but the timing is obvious. Kosovo declared independence in February of 2008. Uh, six months later, we get the war in the Caucasus. Now, you could make the argument that you know Putin was just waiting for an opportunity to do that, um, and I think that's a valid that that is a valid thing. Um, but nevertheless, there is a connection there. And as Alan said in his introduction, Putin specifically cited uh, the Kosovo case as as a precedent for for what happened in August of 2008. And you know. In terms of regional stability, a lot of the arguments in 2008 in that period was that um, Kosovo independence would promote regional stability. I think that's an open question yet. We'll see uh, what happens. Um, I would argue that you know, what we've seen over the past four or five years, I think the situation in Macedonia has been getting worse since 2008. Um, but we can go into that more in, in the Q&A. Now, what's the state of current international policy regarding secession in the Balkans? I would argue that it's a combination of Romeo and Juliet and sleeping with the enemy. So the Romeo and Juliet part of it is that, you know, people who love each other can't be together, um, which we see throughout the region. But there's also the sleeping with the enemy part. You know, people that hate each other have to be together. That's really, um, that's really the basis of international policy in the region at, at, at the moment. Now, to be perfectly honest, um, that might be a good policy. I go back and forth on this issue myself. I mean, there is a lot to the argument that um, if you start recognizing secession around the region, what the, you know, what the Bosnian Serbs might want to do, what the Bosnian Croats might want to do, what the Albanians in Kosovo want to do, and so forth. Um, it would destabilize all of southeastern Europe. Um, there is a lot to be said for that. And in all justice to the policymakers in the early 1990s who were dealing with these things, um, the big fear that, you know, I don't think it's talked about very much, but I know the big fear in Washington in 1991 and 1992 when people were looking at the breakup of Yugoslavia was what people were thinking about was 25,000 nuclear warheads in the former Soviet Union. And what happens if there's a scramble for control of those things? Um, it obviously would have been a catastrophe. And that's why people wanted to establish the precedent that, no, if these things break up, it's going to be along, along the borders that exist now. Quick question. When is secession possible? Um, my argument would be that it's during the great turning points in, in European history, in the European geopolitical order. Um, i.e. the Congress of Berlin in 1878, uh, the fall of the great empires in 1918, um, the end of World War II and the beginning of the Cold War in 1945, 1989. 20, what, what, what? When's, when is the next point going to be? Um, one of the things that's clear, the pattern is that the geopolitical order in Europe changes every two to three generations. The last time it did was 1989. Um, and take a look at what's going on in Europe right now, the potential breakup of the Eurozone, the effects that would have, and so forth. Now, am I being alarmist? The gentleman you see there is named Jamal Yashari. He's the oldest living person in Kosovo. He's 100 and, 108 years old, I believe, born in 1908. Mr. Yashari has lived through the, the last sultan of the Ottoman Empire, King Alexander, uh, Mussolini, Stalin and Tito, Milosevic, the KLA, Michael Steiner, Herbert von Rompuy. Mm -hmm. um, he's seen all these people come and go. Who else is he going to see if he lives another 10 years, hopefully? Um, 
one of the lessons of Balkan history that we don't, we, I, don't not, I don't think is sunk in is that these are, are always transient regimes. States in, in southeastern Europe come and go every, you know, 20, 25, 30 years. The longest period without border changes in, in southeastern Europe over the past 200 years was during the Tito period. Um, that was about it. So, final thought, has the international community learned how to deal with secession over the past 25 years since the Yugoslav crisis began in 1991-92? Um, and this is a point I have to give credit where credit is due. This is a point Susan Woodward bro uh, brought up in 2008, February of 2008. Her argument was no. If you look at how the international community dealt with um, the declaration and the, the independence declarations of Croatia and Slovenia and subsequently Bosnia and Herzegovina and so forth. Um, it was very haphazard. It wasn't coordinated. Um, and we're still at the same point today. Okay, especially if you look at the way Kosovo's declaration of independence played out in 2008. Um, again, Alan pointed out five members of the, of the European Union haven't recognized Kosovo and probably won't. The president of Cyprus said, you know, somebody asked him when Cyprus will recognize Kosovo. And he said, Cyprus will never recognize Kosovo. Even if Serbia recognizes Kosovo, <laughs> Cyprus is not going to recognize Kosovo. Um, given what's happened in Spain over the past few, few, few uh, years, um, I don't think there's any likelihood that Spain's going to recognize Kosovo's um, uh, independence. You know, obviously countries like India, you know, Georgia is never going to recognize Kosovo, I would argue. Um, this is a problem that's going to last a long time, um, and the international community simply does not have a mechanism for dealing with these things at this moment. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. That's an uh, excellent lead-off hitter, that's what I would say. Um, our, uh, our next speaker we're very lucky to have here today is uh, Edward P. Joseph. Edward is a senior <coughs> fellow at the Center for Transatlantic Relations at the School of Advanced International Studies of Johns Hopkins University in Washington, D.C. He has published many articles, uh, including this week, <coughs> uh, uh, many of them on the Balkans uh, in uh, the most prestigious venues such as foreign affairs, foreign policy, and the New York Times. He has spent more than a dozen years on the ground in conflict affected areas of the Balkans uh, and most recently was the deputy head of the OSCE mission in Kosovo where he led negotiations to organize the elections in May of 2012. Edward Joseph. Thank you. Alan, thank you very much. Very nice to be here. And I second Gordon's uh, remarks that uh, it, it is indeed a privilege to be amongst so many knowledgeable people, especially the uh, gentleman here to my left. Uh, Gordon did great work at Columbia, as you mentioned. And Jerry is probably the foremost expert on one of the most intractable uh, problems of uh, interethnic uh, problems in the world, which is uh, the Mitrovica problem. And Zoltan, it's a, it's a great pleasure to meet you and uh, I just rep read your impressive bio. So really very pleased to be here, especially so I was, uh, Alan, I thought that maybe you gave me an honor because it seems as if my microphone is the uh, University of Texas uh, microphone there, if I'm not mistaken, the, the color, the, the burnt orange there, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm especially honored to be here. Let me, uh, in the uh, 15 minutes that I have, uh, let me try to quickly sum up what I'm, what I'm about to uh, convince you of. The first, uh, because well, I am, I'm going to try to present an argument and, and convince you of that in this uh, 14 minutes that I now have, because uh, Alan is uh, <laughs> counting very carefully here. But uh, in these 14 minutes, this is what I'm uh, going to try to quickly cover. I'm going to try to cover uh, the reference point of how folks try to address the uh, dissolution of Yugoslavia and these very contentious issues. And then I'm going to try to explain my main thesis, which is that 
the uh, impact of secession, particularly Kosovo secession, is exaggerated. That's my main contention. And in fact, Alan, just to use your terms, because I think you put it in, in very good uh, way, stark way, I would look at it the other way. It isn't that uh, recognition of secession that produces violence. Rather, I would look at it completely different. It's ignorance of conflict. It's not secession and recognition. It's the underlying disputes, uh, which uh, Gordon alluded to in, in some respects, which have gone on uh, some recently and, and some for uh, time. So that we're a little bit distracted. And instead, if we look at the question of secession, in fact, we find it's, uh, that notion is somewhat exaggerated. And I'm going to try to sustain my thesis by giving you some concrete examples. So let me begin. The main lesson that I think we would take away from the uh, International Court of Justice uh, decision on uh, Kosovo's declaration of independence is that you should be very careful how you ask a question. It's probably uh, the lesson. Be very careful how you ask the question. So in this case, here we should also be precise what it is that uh, we're asking. Are we saying, gee, was Kosovo's uh, in, independence and recognition of it, was that the mistake? Uh, do, is, does Kosovo somehow now uh, justify uh, the, how do you distinguish between the North Kosovo case, how do you distinguish between Albanians in Macedonia, Serbs in Republika Srpska? Is that the question? For me, uh, you can reduce all of these. It basically becomes a line drawing question. It was summed up in that immortal uh, phrase by uh, Vladimir Gligorov, Kirill Gligorov's son, who said uh, during the breakup of Yugoslavia, Alan, you know, of course, the quote, why should I be a minority in your country when you can be a minority in mine? And what he was getting at was the absence of hard and firm standards to apply, and that, and that we saw was, in fact, the case in, uh, as the breakup of Yugoslavia. If you look to international law, and there are experts here who know far more than I on this subject, you look to the UN Charter, self-determination of all peoples. Peoples are not defined. You go to the Helsinki Accords, you have contradictory principles between self-determination and inviolability of borders and, and territorial integrity of states. Self-contradictory. Then in walks the Badinter Commission uh, at the time trying to wrestle with these things. In my view, in retrospect, you can see rather naive, uh, accepting pro forma uh, promises to, to address things. For example, in Croatia, saying, well, gee, if Franjo Tudjman just adjusts uh, the uh, constitutional provisions, which he did, and then on that basis, uh, the EC recognized. Or, well, uh, Macedonia, it's okay. Uh, you're okay. You, you've done enough. Uh, we can see in retrospect, when you compare that to what the arduous task of really making peace in uh, Dayton Agreement, uh, the Z4 plan, which preceded that, uh, Atasari plan, when you see what really we have to do in order to address these kinds of grievances, you can see how inadequate the uh, Badinter approach, understandably, was. The difficulty of wrestling with the demography question, and I would cite as well the ignorance, really, of the one of the, the most stunning and, and most significant fact of the breakup of former Yugoslavia. So obvious, people forget to look at it, which is the imbalance in weapons. Who had the weapons and who had controlled the weapons then, of course, uh, that more than any other factor, more than any uh, legalistic or formalistic approach, that decided the course. So for example, if you looked at Belgrade's approach to uh, Kosovo as opposed to uh, <laughs> The uh, Serbs in Croatia, the, the RSK, a formalistic, legalistic argument on Kosovo, it's part of Serbia, and therefore, by law, it's ours, it's not even a republic. And then with the Serbs in Croatia, of course, hey, they have the right to self-determination. So, uh, and again, what really counted was, uh, of course, uh, the weaponry in, in, uh, to uh, pursue that approach. And then finally, the international community approach. Uh, Gordon, I think, mentioned uh, division, and I would agree uh, completely with that. There was uh, division, and of course, in this country, great reluctance to get involved. Uh, the famous line from someone well known to Texas, James Baker, uh, we don't have a dog in that fight. And that was probably one of the most uh, prophetic uh, lines as well. 
So today we come to, after, what are we left with in this confusion? We still, I think, that there's an absence, really, of, uh, uh, of firm criteria and essentially what people seem to be most con con uh, concerned with. Alan, you used the, the right word, exactly, contagion. Pe this is what people are mostly concerned with, and they look at the Kosovo case and say, oh, you know, you, this uh, here, it was a contagion and so forth. And I think what, what we've done, Alan, is we've gotten so focused on that that we've forgotten the uh, good work that Badinter and others had done, and the right focus was shifting back on, on, the, on the minority grievance, if we can use the term minority. And please, uh, let's just avoid semantics today, and, and you can substitute minority for secessionist, it, it doesn't matter, I know that it's, it's inherently a charged term to say minority because who are you calling a minority when I'm a majority in my own state? But we'll, let's just for here suspend that and substitute the word minority or uh, secessionist. Uh, and so in fact, Alan, the, the, the uh, international approach has been uh, mostly uh, reluctance uh, to, to get involved. And now we struggle here with this question of, of contagion and instead of returning to the real focus on how do you deal with the grievance? How do you deal with the underlying conflict? And that to me is really the question in my view. I'm of the sui generous uh, school. I, I think there, these conflicts need to be addressed in and of themselves and I think we get too concerned with precedent. How do I support my argument? How can I convince you that this approach is, is right? Well, what I've done is rather than just say, well, gee, look, look at all these different examples, there's this one and that. When I come up with a taxonomy, a taxonomy or a, a matrix of, of types of impact, let's, let's imagine from the, the Kosovo situation, and, and I see four that you could categorize. The four categories are, first, you have the direct impact. That's the one where you have similar, the same peoples are locked in a, in a struggle in the neighborhood. It's directly, in fact, in the neighborhood. So therefore, uh, Kosovo independence, Milorad Dodik in Republic of Serbska in Bosnia. Serbs, you have direct impact. You have Ali Akhmeti in Macedonia uh, there. Direct engagement there. That's the, the most immediate impact. And you see, even with people's comments, Dodik, Akhmeti, that, that there is some uh, effect here. We, we would be naive and we would be wrong to say that there's no effect. But we have to distinguish those direct neighborhood effects from the supposed uh, second one of this inspirational uh, effect. And I'll give you a few examples why I think that that's really largely uh, nonsense. In fact, the, uh, one of the proof for that is the third category, which um, I think Gordon and Allen both alluded to, the Russia-South Ossetia case, which I would call the opportunistic uh, impact of, uh, of Secession, which I, I think it really uh, defeats the, the question of any contagion. And then finally, you might look generally to see if there's any cumulative impact. Let me quickly run down the examples. Okay, in the neighborhood, we do have these two cases. We have the question, what about North Kosovo? What about Republic of Srpska? And uh, what about uh, Macedonia? I'm going to deal with them at the end. Let me quickly cite, already five minutes? Oh my god. Um, I'm going to quickly cite the, uh, uh, an example that I think is overlooked uh, in the neighborhood. Because oh, Kosovo independence, Kosovo independence. Everyone forgets Montenegrin independence. What about Montenegrin independence? Why wasn't, why wasn't that uh, the, the, it was worried about for a long time? Why wasn't that uh, a, uh, a signal? And in fact, if you look at some remarks, for example, Prime Minister Cech, who cited it as one, but yet no one really considers it. A, uh, a real example. And furthermore, the reason why uh, the Montenegrin case is, uh, is important in Kosovo is it underscores the lack of any serious alternative to independence for Kosovo. If Belgrade could not convince a majority of Montenegrins, co-religionists, speaking the same language, unlike uh, closer to Serbs than any other group in former Yugoslavia, even closer than Macedonians. The, the cultural links between Montenegrins and Serbs, the historical links, their, their presence in Belgrade, it's, uh, it's, you, it would be hard pressed to find a similar example throughout the world and you couldn't even convince a majority of Montenegrins to remain in this. What chance would you realistically have, what alternative would you have for uh, 
a demographic situation like Kosovo, where exactly as Gordon has, has proved, even prior to World War II, the violence, the inter-ethnic violence had gone on. What chance would you have if Montenegrins wouldn't want to stay? So I think that example is quite overlooked. Then wider inspiration. Let me uh, quickly run through these. I think it's really, uh, I'll use a, a really technical academic term here, nonsense. I think it's mostly nonsense, uh, really. Do, does anyone really think, uh, I, I'm going to have to sum it, I have to, I have to rush here really quickly. But does anyone think a Tibetan monk who's about to light himself on fire is looking at a picture of Hashim Thachi and saying, you know, oh my god, you know, yes, Kosovo, uh, uh, Tibet next. And, and the way you really deal with this is flip the question on his head. Imagine Kosovo had not become independent. Would that Tibetan monk not light himself on fire? Would a Kurd in Kurdistan say, oh, well, I guess I'm here in Turkey. Uh, you know, I, mean, I guess I'm here in Iraq, because, you know, look at those Albanians. You know, they didn't get it. Uh, uh, same Palestine was cited. Uh, the, some Palestinians uh, have cited the example. But come on, that conflict proceeds without any real serious reference uh, to Kosovo. It hasn't either aggravated it, it in any material sense. And then we, we failed to look at other examples. East Timor, East Timor, uh, why aren't we obsessed with the East Timor example? And look in the neighborhood of East Timor, Aceh. Aceh is, is not independent. So, uh, and in fact, what interesting, Atasari and Peter Fife, two Kosovo hands involved in the Aceh example, which is a very different one. So I think, this notion of wider inspiration has, uh, is really uh, quite exaggerated. And then that brings you to the South Ossetia case. And again, it was pointed out, the argument, and obviously there are experts here who know far, far more than I do about it. But the basic narrative that I have consulting those who know is that Russia exploited this, not South Ossetians. This conflict was uh, well underway for many reasons, but it was, uh, it was not an inspiration to South Ossetians. It was uh, an opportunistic moment for Russia to deliver a blow against an upstart former constituent uh, republic of, uh, of the Soviet Union. And in fact, as you saw in, in the conflict, not just skirmishing and confining its activity within South Ossetia proper, but taking the advantage to do strikes within uh, Georgia proper. And that the, the other point of Alan that I think undermines any notion of uh, contagion is look at the lack of recognitions. Who recognizes South Ossetia? Was, is it anyone besides Nicaragua? Did Russia even, the Serbia, Greece did not. Did Serbia, or did Russia even then recognize if it was going to be consistent recognizing the Gorno Karabakh as some Armenians hoped? No, it didn't happen. So in fact, these, these opportunistic, cynical exploitation shows that it, others, anyone looking at them would know, look, that, that it, it, it's, it's transparently cynical and opportunistic and therefore has no real impact. And that diminishes, of course, the cumulative impact. Then now in the uh, one, I, I made a lot of compliments at the beginning, so, so <laughs> give me, give me a, a minute extra here, Alan, just to well, wind it up. Let's return to the, to the, let's return to the legitimate problem. Let's return to the real problem. What about North Kosovo, Republika Srpska, uh, Albanians and Macedonia? Because unlike these others, that's a real question. That's a real, if you were a Serb in one of these places, you might well say, hey, how come, why do they get, and, and not me. And what I would do is say, what we have to do is return and come up with serious criteria that look at those conflicts, not ones that are from South Ossetia and drawn from, but let's look at the, at the real thing. Number one, is there a peace agreement in place? If so, who's respecting it and who's not respecting it? Is it the majority or is the minority uh, respecting it? Uh, and and what, was there any linkage, any tacit linkage to that, to, to the situation that we see? Second, human rights. Are, are human rights being respected or not? Um, uh, and, and here's a, a key one that this addresses a point that Gordon, right? if human rights are, are not being respected of a, a quote, minority, is it state-sponsored violations? Do we see state-sponsored violations? And to me, Gordon, that's the biggest difference. That's why I would not use this model where Albania, Serbs abused Albanians in the 90s, and now Albanians have returned. You had uh, that immediate spurt. You had March 2004. But for the most part, I think it's not comparable at all to uh, what uh, happened when Milosevic took out uh, autonomy. That was state-sponsored. It was systematic. It was pervasive. Not to say Serbs have a wonderful time 
in south of the Ebar, but I think these are quite distinct uh, now, and the opportunities are quite distinct. And then you look at uh, demography, demographic changes. Uh, what are the changes? How recent are they? Who caused them? And I think this is, this is the one that goes to the Republic of Serbska example. Uh, what about those demographic changes? How did they come about? How is it that the entire eastern Drina River Valley that was majority, not just plurality, majority Bosniak from Bielina down to Foča, how come, how come there's no Bosniaks? How did, how did that come to be? Did they just decide they, one day they don't want to live in the Drina River Valley? No. We know the answer is quite different. And that, and that we also know that the terms of the Dayton Agreement are such that those people have a right to return. Is that being respected? That deeply complicates any analogy that anyone would try to make about Kosovo and then uh, to Republic of Serbska. Then quickly, you uh, applying this uh, to Macedonia. Uh, you would look at like the Balkans, of course, you first look at territory and expulsion. That's the, the overwhelming dynamic. That's how people fight wars and, and control territory. People forget in that short conflict in 2001, 10% of the, of the population of the country was displaced. 10% in just those short period. And uh, both, and they were ethnic Macedonians and they were Albanians. And guess what? Contrary to every other place, in every other conflict in, the, in former Yugoslavia, nearly all of them have returned. So you have a, a very different situation. You look at the implementation of Okrid, we, we can discuss that later, but again, who's at fault and so forth. And then the, uh, uh, you would also have to look and climb into the reality of what would be the likely uh, impact uh, there. Would there be a move towards secession or not? You'd have to consider about the likelihood. So I'm out of time. I hope I've convinced you the focus should not be on the secession. The focus should be on the underlying conflict. Thank you very much for listening. This, this reminds me of the old uh, 60 Minutes, or maybe it's the old Saturday Night Live with the point-counterpoint. I think we saw two very, very stark uh, contrasting perspectives on the situation, which is uh, exactly what I was hoping for, to help spur debate and, and hopefully some some insight today. Uh, our next speaker is Gerard Gallucci. Uh, Jerry worked for 25 years as a U.S. diplomat, specializing in Africa and Latin America, and also served as a U.N. peacekeeper. After, quote unquote, retirement from the U.S. government, uh, he worked in Kosovo's northern areas from 2005 to 2008 as U.N. regional representative. He also worked in East Timor, which we referred to today, as a chief of staff for the UN mission. He has a PhD from the University of Pittsburgh in political science, so he's one of us. And he blogs on Kosovo at www.transconflict.com. Jerry. I'm plunging in not to lose time. <laughs> I arrived in Mitrovica in July 2005, understanding that the conflict along the Ibar River was tribal, zero sum. Western European leaders and Washington Europeanists didn't seem to get it. Europe allowed Yugoslavia secessions to occur in the hands of the first wave of ethnic politicians. The Quint the US, UK, France, Italy, and Germany, that's the contact group minus Russia, trying to shake Kosovo off their boots, entrusted secession there to the Kosovo Albanians. The US favored an EU lead because it kept Washington off the hook and kept the Albanians a European problem. On the ground in Kosovo, it's always been a struggle over control and territory. South of the Ibar, with EULEX and ICO, those were the international supporters of Kosovo independence, with their help, Pristina pushed the remaining and surrounded Serb enclaves to accept coming under its rule. The North resisted. Local Serbian institutions and links to Belgrade there were never challenged by NATO or the UN. It would have always taken force to do that. The French understood they had the military role in the North, and they didn't push it. And the United States understood initially because they refused to have the lead role in the North initially. UNMIC, the UN mission, also came to understand. 
I was sent in 2005 to open communications with the radical leadership among the local Serbs in, in the north. But the quint pressure to impose Pristina led to the March 2008 courthouse debacle of violence when they tried to seize control of the courthouse, when the UN and NATO did. And only recently, perhaps, has given way to a, a tendency to find compromise. The unresolved status dispute allows Kosovo political leaders to avoid grappling with real problems, sustainable economic growth and corruption. The obsession over Serbia and the North fostered by the leadership and encouraged by Pristina's international supporters sustains a groupthink nationalism that distracts the population and prevents development of a vibrant, independent civil society. Economic issues were never tackled in the negotiations conducted by President Dadasari, and they figure little in the plan he developed. Pristina simply moved forward with privatizing former publicly owned enterprises and socially owned enterprises, leaving inevitable doubts about ownership. Negotiating a framework for settling property claims could play a positive role in moving towards status resolution and allow development of a natural relationship between the developing Kosovo economy and the larger Serbian one. In 2008, Yugo Petrol offered a deal to put aside issues of seized property for the right to enter the wholesale market in Kosovo. Neither the Quint nor Pristina showed any interest. But business could still lead the way in showing the benefits of regional cooperation. The unresolved property issues also relate to the question of returns in the issue of the North. Many people, Albanians, Serb, and others, live without access to their homes or property. Reconciliation is more difficult when thousands of people live as IDPs. Northern Kosovo Serbs resist Pristina rule of law in part because they believe it would be used to impose the, ret the return, and I'll explain why I'm using quotes, anybody who wants to ask later, of, of Albanians to the north, to North Mitrovica, they think it's, it's meant to change the ethnic balance there. Global approaches to returns, assuring the property rights of all IDPs and allowing them to use the proceeds from sales to make a new life where they are could help return to change this problem of returns into part of a solution. The central issue, however, remains status. While Kosovo independence was inevitable by 2007, the Quint prejudged the outcome, independence on Pristina's terms. Artasari was reduced to holding proximity talks rather than direct negotiations. It might have been more effective for the contact group to use its leverage with both sides to push them to sit in a room together without outsiders until they came to a deal. Instead, the Quint worked against direct negotiations between Belgrade and Pristina. The U.S. apparently prevented talks in 2009 and 10 about possible approaches including territory swaps. The Quint also erred in allowing, if not encouraging Pristina, to bully the Serbs, north and south, into Kosovo, rather than patiently building Kosovo as a model of multi-ethnic uh, multi cooperation and drawing them in. Allowing Pristina to take down electricity and telecoms in the south to focus the Serbs there on accepting their situation was quicker, but did not lead to goodwill or trust. The Quint was also too quick to push aside the United Nations. It put all its eggs into the EU Lex basket. Then it pushed EU Lex and K4, NATO, to step outside their UN mandate to force the Serbs in the north into the arms and south into the arms of Pristina, thus making the EU Lex and K4 a damaged instrument for peace. The Quint's haste and reliance on force and its feeding of Pristina's obsession over the north have contributed to the current impasse and the danger of violence. The North cannot be won by force. Some in the North are comfortable with a continued frozen conflict, and some may believe that real violence would then set them free of Kosovo altogether. 
But the northern resistance to Pristina institutions is near universal and not the creation of radicals or criminals. Northern Kosovo Serbs see Pristina rule of law as an end to their communal existence. They believe Albanians want them out and want their land, and they're right. But more and more northerners do see that something must change, that maybe it's time to look at some sort of arrangement. They do not want to be part of Kosovo, but also they know they can't escape it. They lack leaders and political space. Continued pressures from the Albanians, K4, and EU Lex make it de very difficult for anyone to step forward with new ideas. But new interlocutors cannot be bought through Pristina's Potemkin office in North Mitrovica or with US aid money. The Quint would be better off restraining the Albanians than trying to force a one-sided solution on the North. To settle the North, the Quint and Pristina need to accept adjusting the Artisari plan to the uniqueness of the North. The EU-sponsored talks between Serbia and Kosovo have made some progress. The EU seems pleased with itself for using its leverage over Serbia, prospective membership in the EU, to press Belgrade forward. Since the advent of the post tadic government, Belgrade has moved more briskly toward an accommodation over Kosovo. They proposed a platform in which Serbian municipalities would have a certain autonomy within Kosovo, but links with Pristina as well as Belgrade. The issue of sovereignty would be put aside, with Serbia talking about autonomous Kosovo and Pristina claiming Kosovo's in, in, uh, territorial integrity. Belgrade's platform explicitly accepts participation of Kosovo Serbs in central institutions. Should there be an arrangement that proves to safeguard local self-government for the northern Serbs, they should participate in central institutions such as the legislature. They could be kingmakers in Kosovo politics, given the various disputes amongst the Albanians. Imagine endings, imagine endings, imagined for Kosovo must first overcome considerable distrust northerners have of Albanians. They fear that any role in their communities given to Pristina will be used against them. Prime Minister Thatchy has highlighted his government's expectations from dialogue. He wants the parallel institutions abolished, including municipal administrations, the courts and the police, and Pristina's authority extended to the northern border on the terms of the Artisari plan as it has been haltingly applied south of the Ibar. Thatchy claims there is no pressure from the internationals to go any further. The way southern Kosovo Serbs were bullied into submission and treated afterwards, land grabs, attacks, desecrations, does not engender trust. But beyond that, Pristina's continued demand that its control be extended north underscores the fundamental reason for the distrust by the northerners. Northern Serbs believe Pristina will use any opening to exercise authority on their side of the Ibar to advance an agenda of replacing them, first in North Mitrovica and then the rest. Indeed, the Artisari plan as written gives Pristina the ability to interfere and block transfers of funds from Belgrade, overrule local decisions, take part in choosing local police commanders, and have its courts and judges replace those now operating in the north. The role in the transfer of funds would allow Pristina to put a stranglehold on northern municipalities. An ability to overrule local decisions could allow it to nullify local government and even create seeming crises of legality justifying intervention. Making local police commanders dependent upon its approval could place Pristina in the position of injecting its police or army into the north without organized resistance. Placing its courts and judges in the north could allow the legal enforcement of one-sided property claims and returns. Whether one finds this scenario credible or not, it's how northerners see it. They do not trust Pristina to do anything else. The EU dialogue has made certain progress, not fully implemented in the North due to the mistrust. But this should not lead to excessive optimism. The Quint and Belgrade need to understand, need to win the understanding, if not the full agreement, 
of the northern Serbs as their peaceful resistance on the ground could scuttle any arrangement. But a plan leaving the north unmolested by, by Pristina with links to Belgrade and still an integral part of Kosovo could work. Northern Serbs may come to accept something like this, but almost certainly won't go beyond. Belgrade understands this if the EU doesn't and has made clear it will not simply disband its institutions in the north and hand them to Pristina. The Nikolic Dasic government has gone far in suggesting an open-ended framework with autonomous local institutions working under internationals within the Kosovo context. But Pristina would have to keep its hands off. This would require real EU-US peacemaking and probably continued peacekeeping. Other issues remain. Implementable status neutral approaches on economic issues, including telecoms, customs, energy, water, and state property, including Trepsha, must be implemented. Returns need to be treated globally. And there, of course, is the issue of North Mitrovica itself. North Mitrovica is the only major urban area in Kosovo with a mixed population. It has Albanians, Bosniaks, Turks, Roma, and Gorani living amongst the Serb majority. It has always had local self-government since 99, along with the other three northern municipalities. The Quint and the Albanians call these parallel, but that's all there's ever been, except in a limited sense, the United Nations. Two central questions will need answers in, in settling the specific question of North Mitrovica. What are its borders and what relationship, if any, to South Mitrovica? North Mitrovica has been defined since 99 as the area administered by the UN north of the Ibar River. When Adesari was drawing up his map, he, we worked with him and he tried to mirror a, a, an ethnic line in the north, uh, which placed some uh, Serbs in the Al Albanian section to be attached to the south and left some, uh, some Serbs in the Albanian area and some Albanians in, in the Serb area. This would have made both North and South Mitrovica multi-ethnic. Right now, South Mit Mitrovica is not multi-ethnic. It has no Serbs left. Um, but this, this was predisposed on there being a mutual agreement and a, and a, and a climate of trust. Uh, these do not exist any longer. And, and um, the natural boundary between North and South Mitrovica is the Ibar River. The Artisari plan also included a joint board, which the Albanians wanted to have basically with executive authority, so they could use it still to keep uh, some level of control over North Mitrovica. The uh, Northern Kost Mitrovica Serbs rejected for that reason. Uh, some forum between the two sides of the E-bar makes certain sense, and it should include the uh, other three Northern municipalities as well, but the Northern Serbs would not accept it having any kind of executive authority. Uh, the Artisari plan includes special features for North Mitrovica, including for a hospital and university. But defining the boundaries and relationship between the two Mitrovicas will uh, require acceptance of the fact that North Mitrovica is perhaps the most zero-sum issue of all, and it cannot simply be left to Pristina. I believe in the end that the Northerners could be made to accept an arrangement such as the platform proposed by the Serbian government. I don't think they'll go any further. And I think that any effort to make them go further will lead to further conflict and difficulties. Uh, the EU right now is trying to bully Serbia with its April deadline for its next decision on EU membership to crunch the final, the final numbers and come to the final surrender. Um, I, don't think, I don't think Dostic can do that. I don't think the Serbian government can do that. I think the fact that they've offered that Dasic himself has raised again the, the notion of partition. Uh, we talked about this beforehand. I don't think it's an inconsistent position. I think what he's saying is, look, the simplest way to do this is redraw boundaries. I happen to agree with that, despite all of the pros and cons. But if you don't accept that, then here's this other plan, an autonomous Serb uh, association of municipalities within Kosovo. And I think that's the choice facing the uh, quint. And if we're ready to accept that, uh, there can be some progress. And if we're not, it's, it, it could get worse. Thank you.
As you can tell about Jerry, he, uh, he speaks his mind. Uh, I learned that when I visited him in North Mitrovica, I think in 2007. Um, thanks again for coming. Okay, so uh, to try and figure out some way to synthesize uh, these remarks, we have uh, our discussion here from uh, the University of Texas at Austin, uh, Zoltan Barani, who is the Frank C. Irwin, Jr. Professor of Government uh, here at the University of Texas over at the Government Department. He's the author of many books, uh, including most recently, The Soldier and the Changing State, Building Democratic Armies in Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas by Princeton University Press. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations in New York and the International Institute for Strategic Studies uh, in London. Zoltan. Well, thank you, Alan. I'm humbled by the uh, panel that you put together and uh, reminded by many IR theorists who like to make big theories about civil war and minorities but don't actually know any of these places, that there is no substitute for really uh, knowing these areas. Uh, obviously, secession is a hugely intractable problem. And uh, uh, what I found very interesting that uh, through the uh, ages, many uh, of the main political theorists of the Western tradition, from Plato to Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Marx, Hegel, Mill, basically left this whole issue as a virgin territory for political theorists. So if uh, I think that there's a great opportunity for someone to really tackle the issue because there's so much of it's left undone and so many, uh, so many areas uh, that can uh, still be profitably mined. Um, I was hired here in 1991 to teach East European politics, which I haven't done in, in the last 10 years. Uh, the reason is that I really like messy countries, and once countries join the EU, I lose interest in them. <laughs> uh, the Balkans is a place where it's hard to lose interest. So uh, I have maintained some, but I'm, I must confess that I'm certainly not an expert. Uh, I have done some work, and I go back because I have close friends in, uh, in uh, Skopje, uh, both in the Macedonian and the Albanian communities. But basically, when I started teaching this course on East European politics, uh, which was right after, of course, the, uh, the fall of communism, uh, it was hard not to realize that virtually all these places that were put together by force or by the implied, implied force, and in that region that I was studying at that point, of course, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, and the Soviet Union, they all fell apart because uh, the people's uh, uh, intention or or desire to uh, form sovereign countries or sovereign nations, of course, does not uh, change. And, uh, of course, if you look at the, the world today, there are basically everywhere p uh, regions where uh, uh, people uh, have tried and continue to try to be, uh, to, uh, be free from what they call their oppressors, from Russia to China to Turkey, Thailand, India, Pakistan, all of these places. So to come up with a policy of, of how to deal with these as uh, preparedly is the, uh, the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the tasks of this, uh, of this seminar is pretty tall order. Uh, and uh, it just, but of course it would be incredibly valuable if you come up with anything useful. The uh, international organizations, and here the EU actually does have some uh, possibility because international organizations do have some leverage to get people and governments to do things uh, what they might not want to do otherwise, uh, as long as they seek the benefits of aid or membership. Uh, uh, that, that IOs might have to offer. And the, a recent example for this is NATO expansion, where actually uh, NATO was able to, uh, to force some of those countries that desperately wanted to be in NATO, 
to do things, uh, even in the minority areas, uh, that uh, they would not have uh, wanted to do otherwise. So the EU is obviously uh, uh, somewhat better positioned because it has an uh, uh, enforcement mechanism that other uh, uh, international organizations like NATO, for instance, does not really have. It has the ability to, uh, to reward and uh, punish uh, compliance with the withholding of funds and so on and so forth. Uh, now, coming to, to the former Yugoslavia more specifically, so these were obviously three very different perspectives and very rich in their, in their own ways. Uh, I really like the large picture uh, that Gordon painted, particularly with the uh, with the uh, this sensitivity to history that all of these problems have have been going on for centuries and uh, and are really unlikely in in my not very well informed opinion to uh, to be uh, to be resolved anytime soon one of the uh, one of the things that it struck me when I was last in bosnia and and uh, talking to people is uh, the growing uh, distance of ethnic communities from one another. Uh, particularly, I was giving a lecture at the, uh, at the University of Sarajevo, and then uh, I went out to have some drinks with people. And so I found out that, of course, since the war, a new generation had grown up. But basically, it's a generation that uh, I was given the impression that had absolutely, like, Bosniak students have no, no relationship whatsoever with, uh, with Serbian students or with Croatian students, which was not the case before. I appreciate, I actually read uh, some of uh, Gordon's recent uh, papers, and uh, I think it's very important to realize that, uh, for instance, how exaggerated uh, in some people's uh, 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 work was the intermarriage between Bosniaks and and Croatians and the Catholics and Orthodox and so on. It was actually very, very small as, as uh, Gordon uh, shows. But these people had a lot of interaction with one another. And this interaction seems to me is, uh, is uh, increasingly rare. And uh, I wonder if uh, that's a question that I would like to pose to the panel. Uh, if, there any, uh, if, if there is any way to reverse this, and if there is, uh, uh, what would they be? How could these, uh, how could these uh, uh, communities uh, be uh, made to have more interaction with one another? How can they find out more, especially young people? I think that's the really the most uh, uh, troubling, uh, troubling fact about this. The second point that I wanted to ask or briefly discuss is the uh, is Macedonia, Macedonia particularly, which. Uh, of course, it was the one republic in Yugoslavia that escaped civil war and, and uh, large-scale uh, ethnic hostilities. And Kiro Gligorov, whose son was mentioned, obviously was an individual, a leader, who made an eno enormous uh, uh, difference. And this also raises the issue that in political science, now finally, <laughs> once again, the idea of leadership comes back because it was not really quantifiable. Also. A lot of people didn't want to talk about the importance of leadership. But uh, if you look at the Balkans, it uh, seems to me, just, just look at Kiro Gligorov, whom I had the good fortune to, to meet a few times. And is there, any, is there any doubt that things would have turned out worse if someone of, of less, uh, you know, a less foresightful character was there? Or is there any doubt that things would have been different if it wasn't you know, Slobodan Milosevic, but somebody else. I think that leaders have a, a huge, a huge, can still make a huge difference. Uh, what is interesting to, to me about Macedonia is also what Edward mentioned, that after this uh, February, August 2001 mini war, all but a very large percentage of people actually returned to, uh, to their homes, which is, I think is, is a unique uh, phenomenon in, in the, uh, the Balkans. So what uh, you guys know far more about this uh, region than I do. And what, what really interests me, both as a political scientist, but also as a person who 
who really likes and very fond of Macedonia is what makes it different. What makes it different from the uh, from the uh, the other uh, other regions there, and uh, what are the prospects for for Macedonian uh, Albanian coexistence in uh, uh, in in the Republic of Macedonia, particularly with the uh, understanding uh, of uh, some of the Albanian uh, uh, propaganda and even provocation going on. And Gordon had the uh, uh, Berisha's quote from. Uh, from last November, where he urged all Albanians to work every minute for, for independence and so on and so forth. So, I would I wish that I could have given my extra four minutes to Edward, uh, because uh, I could have learned far more from him, and you would have learned far more from him than from me. But anyway, let me uh, ask you to uh, be the first to ask these questions. Thank and uh, sure, Zoltan, thank you. The chair and say that we should really open um, open the floor now to questions and answers. And what I would say is, um, yeah. I would invite the, uh, the the presenters when they're answering questions from the audience to feel free to address any of the comments that uh, Zoltan made <coughs> in his discussion. And uh, I would say, feel free to also just if you can just uh, speak into the microphones at the table. I think that'll be logistically easier. So. Um, I invite questions from the audience over here at the microphone. Okay, we have a first question. So, Lawrence, wait till you get to the microphone. <laughs> so my name is Lawrence Bede. I'm an adjunct professor here at, uh, at the LBJ School. And I have a question about the, the kind of general setup of, of, of all of your um, <coughs> discussions of, of this topic, because I feel like y you, all of you give very good examples of all the very complicated problems that, that Kosovo faces, both in terms of um, North Mitrovica and, and relations with Serbia. But my question is still about the, the, the question of secession, because um, I feel like it's clear that secession brings with it a lot of problems. And you've, you've gone into this in terms of precedent, in terms of contagion, in terms of the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the North Mitrovica problem. But my question is, what are the alternatives to secession? Because I don't think there's some sort of non-secession status quo to which you can return. So my question to you is, you know, what, what do you see as kind of workable alternatives? Because to, to me, what seems uh, to be the, the obvious alternatives are either, at least in the case of Kosovo, condoning you know, state-sponsored ethnic violence by, by Serbia, or having this kind of endless UN tutelage um, where there's this whole, you know, region of the of the world that does not have any sovereignty at all because it's not like Serbia really had any control over it. So, my question is really, you know, what what are the what are the real alternatives to this? Because I feel like in in a way, it, if we accept that those are really untenable alternatives, then secession is just this sort of ined inevitable lesser of not two evils but 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 many evils. So I I, I just wonder what you what, what you would say to that. Okay. Anybody. Um, I think I think that uh, there there are a couple of general principles, which I took to Mitrovica and I took away from Mitrovica. Be very careful, no matter what you do, whatever, whatever alternatives, in, in, in use of force. Um, anything that has to be resolved through the use of force is probably the wrong thing. Not always, but probably, but probably. Uh, you can start off with what, what would have been a better European approach to, to the breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, I think the Germans led the way into disaster there, and so I, I, I think a more, patient, uh, a more patient approach, an approach which, which perhaps got more involvement up front in trying to achieve a soft landing. But at some point, since the French Revolution, uh, groups which def come to define themselves, I call them tribal because we're all tribal, um, and, and my, my history working in Africa. But, but however you want to call them, na nations, whatever. Once a people come to define themselves that way or see themselves that way or discover themselves that way, it's sort of hard to stop them. And, and, if, you're, and if you're going to look at a situation in which there are a bunch of groups and for some reason they've been unleashed or they've come to be unleashed, let them go. Let them all go. Now, and this is much easier. It's, it's, it's somewhat 
ironic to say, but it's much easier after the disastrous wars of Yugoslavia than it was before. Because before, you would have had a hard time drawing up boundaries. But frankly, one of the results of ethnic cleansing is that some of these boundaries become clearer. And, uh, you know, we live now, not then. And, and so when you've not been able to contribute to a soft landing and either the holding together a, a reformulation of a multi-ethnic empire into some other form of multi-ethnic, was an, another form of Yugoslavia possible? Maybe. But after, after the fact, I think, I think now uh, it would be quite natural to re redraw the state boundaries. Now, some people start jumping up and down. Oh, if we do that, it's going to happen everywhere. Um, every place is different. In Africa, clinging to the colonial boundaries was the only way it could possibly work unless you wanted Africa to sink back into the, a pre-millennial situation. Um, and, and by and large, it has worked, and the Africans themselves have made that work. Uh, in in the, the former Yugoslavia, it's a different case. Maybe you could re redraw the boundaries. I'm struck by the fact that my sources, good sources, tell me that the United States stopped Serbia uh, under Tadic and, and the, the Kosovo, Kosovo government from talking about an exchange of territory. And if you're concerned about Macedonia, well, Macedonia either works as a federation and everybody has a stake in it or it doesn't, and then you figure out how to do a peaceful divorce. Others? You know, th th that's a really interesting question because separating, separating out secession, again, to go back to, to what I opened up with, Secession as a unique moment in time from a longer term historical process is really, you know, I think it's kind of almost an artificial thing to do. Um, you know, these problems don't, they don't emerge at, you know, when a specific leader comes to the fore or whatever. Just to give you a sort of sense, very quickly. Um, I'm very bad at drawing maps. <laughs> Does anybody know what that is? Because Altan, you're an East European specialist, you ought to know. Mm -hmm. it's Eastern Europe 200 years ago. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire. I mean, that's basically what the political map of Eastern Europe looked like about 1800, right? Go to 1918. What does this look like? You've got a few of the Baltic republics have become independent. Czechoslovakia, you've got Austria, you've got Yugoslavia, blah, blah, blah. But it starts to, Bulgaria, Romania, it starts to get smaller and smaller. Go to today, what does it look like? You know, they're just... Mm -hmm. I mean, what we're seeing over 200 years is a long-term historical trend towards the creation of smaller and smaller and more and more mono-ethnic entities. Um, if it's something that's been happening over the course of 200 years, it's hard to argue that it's always the result of bad leaders. Um, I mean, there's something, there's a social, there's a social development that's taking place, a historical, long-term historical trend that's taking place that you can't attribute to, oh, you know, if it wasn't for Milosevic and and to each one and a few other guys, this never would have happened. Um, now, where the leadership does come into play is if you compare what happened in the Soviet Union with, with what happened in Yugoslavia or Czechoslovakia. I mean, that's where you see, okay, in one case you've got violence, in another case you don't. How do you explain that? So I think, you know, part of what we have to do is sort of separate out these long-term historical trends towards the creation of more and more monoethnic entities from the use of violence in doing this. Um, I think that's kind of a roundabout way of trying to address your question. But um, secession is, is, to me, is kind of a subset of, of these broader issues. And you know, given the magnitude of what we're talking about, I'm very skeptical about the extent to which we can control secession um, at any given time. Yeah. Uh, let me, uh, I'm going to try to address all three of the questions, this gentleman's uh, question, but also I'll start with uh, Zoltan's uh, first two questions. The, the one, Zoltan, you asked all excellent questions the, about interaction. Good news, bad news. The, uh, 
the bad news is I, I don't think that there's much prospect for the, the kind of uh, productive, normal interaction that you're talking about. Let me quickly give an example from Bosnia. I remember meeting, I was in uh, Banja Luka a few years back, and I met a uh, Serb there who is in Dodik's party, the ruling party that is a, a guy who was a moderate who is now, of course, by uh, taking a you know, tough stand on most of the issues. And this guy is in his party, loyal member of his party, and he goes to Sarajevo, that is the Muslim town now, you know, the Muslim den there, and, and he goes every week. And he told me, he says he has a great time there, always treated well, loves going there, they love the culture there, it was, it was a city with a big uh, pre-war Serb population. And then he said, but his two, he has two daughters, one, uh, they were then, you know, in their late teens, 18, 19 years old, and he always tried to get them to go with him to visit. It's a beautiful city, it's fun, it's interesting. No interest whatsoever, zero interest. All they wanted to do, only city they wanted to visit was Belgrade. So this, and the, the point I'm so glad you raised it is there was this notion for a while, international community, there's been a, several of these uh, false panaceas, and one of them was generational change. Well, guess what? It's worse. They're more polarized now than they were. And now there are panaceas, oh, oh, economic trade and so forth. There's, there's total freedom of movement in Bosnia. The businesses interact, and so it doesn't change the politics at all. And there are other panaceas as well there. The EU accession will solve everything in Bosnia, but that's a, another story. The good news is I don't know that it's required for the you know, kind of stability. But I should remember the, the, that it is still Europe. Unlike many other troubled parts of the globe, these people have a pathway to a better future. They're not just uh, unmoored and, and uh, left to drift in a, a, a cauldron. They have a, a perspective on life. And so uh, it's maybe not quite so critical that they have the, the kind of thing. Secondly, Macedonia, very quickly. Um, the, the thing that what's really important, the most important thing to remember about Macedonia that distinguishes it from the other is the peace agreement. And I like the peace agreement of, in Macedonia, the Okrit agreement. Why? What's the fundamental difference? Why is it so different? Because it didn't rely on territory. Did not give the Albanians territory. The would-be secessionists got no territory. For them, they got, all it is, Okrit agreement is a list of rights given by the Macedonians to the Albanians. That's all it is. And there's only one obligation on the part of the, Macedon or the Albanians. Give up your weapons, which they did. Surrender your weapons to NATO, which they did. They complied completely with that. And, uh, and, then, and so the only way that Albanians can, uh, can seek their rights is by participating in the state institutions. That's what distinguishes it from the very bad Dayton Agreement. The only way the Serbs can uh, assert and, and achieve their rights in Bosnia is by not participating in the state institutions. No, we have our entity, we want our entity, we don't want anything, to do and that's why it's so bad. And this brings me, Jerry, um, to uh, uh, Kosovo and, and the point uh, there, partition, et, et cetera. Um, before we go too far on sort of uh, internalizing and, and knowing what, either how defiant they are in the North and what they will accept and what they won't accept, let's remember that there's a whole other Serb approach in Kosovo, and it's in the, actually the majority live south of the Ibar. And if you talk to who, who better a representative of the Serb community in Kosovo than a member of the Serbian Orthodox Church, their attitudes are vastly different, Jerry, and you know that. They're vastly different. They see the risks and the dangers, and they also see the prospect. It's not a wonderful, they don't wake up in the morning and say, oh, we're so glad that Hashem Thachi is prime minister. No, they're not, but it's, it's of a different magnitude and order than what it was uh, before. And, the, and they see that there are some reasonable developments. I don't want to say everything's great and wonderful. It isn't. But there are reasonable developments, and there's a very different Serb attitude in the South. They are very anxious and upset when there's provocations and hostility and intransigence in the North. It bothers them to no end, and that's not and all during the standoff. The, the attitude of the Serbian Orthodox Church was rather distant from all the defiance uh, and violence in the North, including some of it, as you know, criminal inspired by the likes of Zvonko Veselinovic, who was arrested by Belgrade. And we forget here, then the last point here I could uh, come up with, but Gordon had that excellent um, thing. If we talk about force, let's use force in quotes. Um, 
you had that terrific uh, photograph of the Albanian who had lived under all those different things. That's force. That's force. He, one day, woke up, it, w it was the Ottoman, uh, you know, the Sultan. The next day was this, the next day was this. There was restiveness, there were re re uh, revolts and so forth, but generally people uh, went along and they understood that what you can accomplish is, is constrained. You're not all powerful. And people in the Balkans, generally compared to other areas, there's no suicide terrorism there. They're generally rather compliant, obedient. They respect top-down order. Instructions, especially coming from Belgrade, are generally respected. So what people will do, what people will tolerate, depends on uh, the context uh, in which they're in. And there's many examples of Albanians, for example, Ali Ahmeti giving up his weapons, not accepting less than. They've, a lot of Albanians wanted Republika Srpska. They wanted Republika Albanska in Macedonia. They knew, uh, uh, Ahmeti knew that they just didn't have the weapons for it. It wasn't possible. So he took something much less. They don't love being in Macedonia. They, they like being in Macedonia no more than a Serb in North Kosovo likes being in, in Kosovo. Their attitudes towards uh, Macedonians, it's not 100% analogous, but, but rather similar. But they tolerate it and accept it because they know that's the reality. I think uh, Serbs in the north, there's been, I, I I think you slightly understated the progress. It's quite significant. This border agreement is quite significant. It's not implemented yet. Ah, oh, well, uh, moving and, and the, we can see what was once, what was once unthinkable, absolutely unthinkable, a hard border between the North and Serbia is it's incrementally approaching and we will see. Uh, even uh, you have a guy like Dacic, we will see in the end when, when Belgrade has to make a choice between their EU prospects and the North, uh, we will see. It, it depends more on, on how, you know, what Brussels uh, does in the end. But, you but speak we will very see. well for what the EU is trying to do to Dosic and to get him to do. Uh, let me, let me if, I, if, I, if I just might respond, first of all, on, on what brings people together. I think business can still do it. In Mitrovica, the one area of Serb-Albanian uh, cooperation was, was crime. And uh, cr crime, crime exists there because there's an unsettled status issue and normal business doesn't take place, so they come together to do criminal activities. Uh, I still think that in the case of Kosovo, if the EU had pursued and would now pursue a program of legalizing Serb telecoms energy, uh, regularizing the situation, leveling the playing field, with Kosovo's small economy next to Serbia's big one, all sorts of natural relationships at the macro and micro level could still, could still make a difference. In terms, in terms of the Macedo Macedonia, I'm not an expert, but I think the fact that the Albanians didn't have the weapons was the most telling point there. And, and that's why they, they, the peace agreement, peace agreement uh, worked. Uh, in, in, in Kosovo, but there's no doubt that the southern Kosovo Serbs feel differently about the situation than the northern Kosovo Serbs because they're surrounded. Uh, they resisted, and under the watchful eyes of the EU police and, and NATO, uh, Pristina authorities went in there and broke up their electrical transformers and threw them into the dark and turned off their telephones. And it was quite natural at some point. They figured they might as well go along with the program. I'd love to see this figure. I don't, I haven't seen it. Maybe somebody has, maybe you have it the figure on the Serbs who are leaving South Kosovo. I know that Serbs who try to return, like one yesterday, uh, his house, his home invasion, was a recent returnee, uh, the record for treating Serbs who remain in, in Southern Kosovo is not great. But obviously, the Albanians are willing to tolerate a certain amount of that. Uh, the real question is, and most Serbs, North and South, I think expect the all but the largest enclaves to evaporate over time as young people leave. But I don't know those figures. Maybe somebody has them. In the north, it's simply different. And they do not feel like they need to accept Pristina or accept any, any, any compromise that Dostage makes. I'm not arguing for this. I learned this firsthand. These people see any extension of Albanian authority into their communities as their death warrant. Sooner or later, it will be used against them. It's quite simple. And the fact that this nice border agreement, I applaud it, hasn't been implemented is because every time EU Lex tries to take some Albanian officers to the north, the, the northerners put up blockades. 
And the only way you can deal with that is send NATO in and kill a bunch of people. That's and NATO true. won't do that. That is not true. Uh, let that, me, they, let, do, let, they do no, helicopter no, no, the men. No, 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 no. no. You, I have to jump in there. Look, look, uh, I'll you, give you, give you 30 seconds because we're already sure. over time. And then no, Gordon is going to get the wrap up. But the thing is, it's fine to sort of uh, disagree on the basic thing. But, but one should not uh, exaggerate and, and uh, say, oh, the only time they go, NATO has to kill people. They did not. NATO. Uh, no, it would have to. I didn't say it because it, it shied away from it. That's not true. It's not true. NATO did, a, in a very clever and, and largely unknown way, NATO defeated all of these so-called citizen uh, uprising uh, blockades and managed to get total freedom of movement back. I'll explain. I won't take time no, now. No, they didn't. They did it without force. They didn't. They did it. They, they, they reached an agreement, an implicit agreement with the Northerners that they wouldn't use access to move around Albanian officers. It was an agreement. It was not an agreement. I'm you're sorry not, it was. You, I'm sorry you're not informed. What they did was... No, you're not informed. <laughs> All right, let's... let's, uh, let's Don't tell me I'm not informed. For I wouldn't respond that way if you didn't accuse me of being misinformed. Let's, let's for the moment, put, put that uh, aside. We'll agree to disagree. Uh, maybe we'll get it resolved later today. But I'll give the fin final word to Gordon Bardas. Okay. Thank you. I just want to address something Zoltan said about about can this be reversed. And I'm, I'm skeptical about that because, you know, as that kind of map shows, I mean, these are massive long-term social developments that are taking place um, with the logic of their own. And I, I have a fundamental disagreement with John Broyley's theory of nationalism that it, it's exclusively a political phenomenon. It's, it's much more than that. And if you, you know, if you just do a literature review of all the books that have been written about the former Yugoslavia and what's been happening there over the past 20 years, I mean, you'll come across books about nationalist artists, you'll come across books about nationalist musicians, nationalist priests, nationalist criminals. <laughs> um, I, I was glancing at a Hungarian cookbook a few weeks ago. You'll find this interesting. And it said that in the 19th century, Hungarians started eating more goulash as a nationalist protest against the Austrians. So in huge, every aspect of, of human life, you see people behaving in a certain way. It's not just a matter of some bad politicians promoting certain policies. As, as Ed pointed out with, with the example of, of these young girls who don't want to go to Sarajevo, um, it's not because some politician tells them to feel that way. Um, this is the way large the overwhelming majority of these populations feel about certain things. And, you know, I think one of the failures of U.S. policy over the past couple of decades is just being focused or fixated on specific leaders without understanding what the bigger underlying trends are that are, that are causing these problems. Thank you. Well, uh, we don't have goulash out there, but we do have uh, some coffee, tea, and some snacks. We'll take about a 20-minute break. I don't think uh, we could have possibly asked for a more dynamic panel. Uh, it's early in the morning, but I am sure no one fell asleep during that one. So uh, we'll take about a 20 minute break and we'll reconvene. Thanks very much to everybody.